Um, I'm the hematologist up here today, and I, well, I guess I'm the first to be attacked by this audience, which would be fine. Um, it's because of me and my colleagues that have switched everybody from warfarin to these agents and has uh, led to nightmares for you guys in the management of GI bleed. So I apologize. It's made it much easier for us, uh, but I understand it's made it somewhat more difficult and, and confusing on your end. Um, so the point of this, or at least the point of my talk today, is to give you a little bit of introduction into the, um, into the management of uh, GI bleeding, or at least the management of anticoagulation with these newer agents which aren't so new anymore, but, um, and then um, have the, obviously the, um, the, the perspective from, a, from an ER physician as well as an ability to uh, have a little bit of a panel discussion. And, and uh, so think of questions that might, uh, that might stump us a little bit, and we'll be happy to, uh, to entertain those. So um, not working so far. OK. Uh, Okay, so as you can see from my first slide here, and I'm going to kind of pivot here because I can read it better on this than I can in that, in that screen there, despite my glasses, is the fact that, as you can see here, there's four different names here. And I will tell you the, an interesting idea is that a GI doctor in my institution came up to me and said, so I understand you're giving a talk about DOACs. What's a DOAC? Does everyone in this audience know what a DOAC is as compared to one of these other um, names up there or acronyms? Because, no, because I don't, I don't describe it as a DOAC, or I've never described these drugs as DOACs. I always describe them as NOACs, but as my colleagues have told me up here in this audience or in, up here in this panel, is that they're no longer that new. So when we're talking about new oral anticoagulants, which is the NOAC, they don't really, it doesn't really make too much sense direct oral anticoagulants. We'll talk about what the other ones might be as well. So I think it's important to focus on terminology first. So from the standpoint of terminology, it's important to differentiate, and I'm sure this is not news to everybody, that there are antithrombotic agents, which include antiplatelet agents and anticoagulants. And the antiplatelet agents are aspirins, Plavix, and those other drugs that are out there that inhibit platelet aggregation. And then the anticoagulants are all the other drugs out there that we typically, as hematologists and cardiologists, tend to prescribe are the warfarins, the heparins, and the oral anticoagulants like we're talking about today. So anticoagulant is anything that acts to inhibit the coagulation cascade. So that's warfarin, heparin, low molecular heparin, direct thrombin inhibitors, and factor 10A inhibitors, and we'll talk about these. So these are the two DOAC kind of classes, DTIs, or direct thrombin inhibitors, and the direct factor 10A inhibitors. So those are the two classes. The most common one that's seen in the DTI or the direct thrombin is dabigatran, which is Prodaxa. Not a ton of use from a hematology standpoint, but a ton in the cardiology space, using more Prodaxa for atrial fibrillation, because it was the first of the novel anticoagulations to, be, uh, to come out in the market. Um, and there are also some parenteral forms for the direct thrombin inhibitors, Angiomax, Revast, and Argatraban you might be familiar with. From the direct factor 10A inhibitors, these don't have IV formats at all. These are the drugs that you may be more familiar with. Rivox, uh, Rivaroxaban, which is Xarelto, Apixaban, which is Eliquis, and then these two, which are typically not given too much in the United States, and we'll talk about why. Um, are the ones that are the direct factor 10A inhibitors. And, and we, I promised you I'd kind of define the names a bit. So DOAC is direct oral anticoagulants. TSOAC is target-specific oral anticoagulant. ODIs are oral direct inhibitors. And NOACs are novel anticoagulants. So these all mean the same thing. So you should know, at least when you're conversing with your colleagues, that if they don't know what a DOAC is, they might know what a NOAC is, they might know what a TSOC is, and they might know what an ODI is. Regardless of what it is, we're dealing with the same thing. Okay, so some historical perspective, I think, is necessary to discuss this a little bit. In the pre-DOAC era, era, so pre-direct anticoagulants, we had heparin, either parenterally or sub-Q, given daily or twice daily, and we had warfarin. Now, warfarin, I will tell you, for years and years and years, I've been practicing for 16, up till about when the first of these drugs came out, all we did for patients on long-term anticoagulation was Coumadin. Coumadin, 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 Coumadin clinics, anticoagulation clinics. They were constantly getting their INR and PTs done. In the odd situation, we'd get people to get 
um, at-home POC-type units at their house to get their INRs on their own and send it over to their physician, but it is a, it's a royal pain. And I kept telling patients, it's just a matter of time before another drug class comes out that will allow us to give you the same safety with no monitoring. So that's the problem with, with Coumadin. You have Coumadin clinics, poor follow-up by patients, compliance issues, and the biggest issue with Coumadin is that you're either super therapeutic, you have an INR of 10, or you're sub-therapeutic, you have an INR of 1. So if you're on Coumadin and you have an INR of 1, you aren't doing any good. If you're on Coumadin and have an INR of 10, you're in the ER with this gentleman over here with a GI bleed or something worse. Okay, but the therapeutic window is so narrow with warfarin that it's a real problem, which made the introduction of these drugs so incredibly useful to the people who prescribe them. So these newer agents block the procoagulant activities in the generation of the fibrin clot, and I have a clot cascade I will spend some time looking at with you guys. It'll either directly target thrombin or directly targeting factor 10A. You either do those and it stops the whole coagulation cascade, but different targets. And the huge advantage is less bleeding. And this is true, and this has been proven. Much less bleeding when compared to Coumadin. Because despite the fact that Coumadin is easy to reverse with vitamin K or FFP, potentially, most patients are either subtherapeutic or super therapeutic, and the bleeding risk is much higher. So less bleeding with the oral agents, much shorter half-life, we'll talk about that as well, and no <clears throat> monitoring, and now reversibility. It's contraindicated, though, for, uh, therefore, in pregnancy, lactation, severe liver disease, and actually does not have an indication for a condition called antiphospholipid syndrome. So the pregnant patients who are on anticoagulation still need to be on heparin-type products. Patients who are nursing still need to be on heparin-type products and not these uh, direct oral anticoagulants. So the coagulation cascade, what nightmares are made of uh, for the non-hematologists out there, I assume, right? No one wants to look at this, but I'm going to point out the two things. So you've got the intrinsic pathway on the right, the extrinsic pathway on the, on the I'm sorry, left, extrinsic pathway on the right. The extrinsic pathway lead, is related to endothelial injury. When there's injury, it's, it starts to cascade through factor seven. This is where the drug Novo 7 is sometimes given by my emergency room colleagues in patients who have bleeding episodes. Unfortunately, Novo 7 doesn't have very much activity on patients on these drugs, and I'll tell you why. Because if you're giving Pradaxa, which is a thrombin inhibitor, it's the lowest on the cascade, right? You're actually preventing thrombin from converting fibrinogen to fibrin, which is the last step of the coagulation cascade. The factor 10A is a little bit upstream of that. And that's either Eliquis or, uh, or Xarelto and other drugs here in this particular pathway. So this is where it acts. It acts either at factor 10A or at thrombin. All right, so the indication for DOAX and why you're seeing patients in your clinic who happen to be on these drugs. Well, multiple indications, but VTE events, right, DVT or, or PEs, with or without cancer, VT prevention, so patients who have had a knee replacement, hip replacement, can be placed on these drugs for about 10 to, 4, 10 to 21 days, depending on the surgeon. Patients on atrial fibrillation. And then there are some IV uses of these drugs in the acute coronary syndromes and in heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. The ones that affect you guys most, I think, as GI doctors, are patients either being treated for DVT or PE, are being prevented from are on some stroke prevention for atrial fibrillation and potentially patients who are on VT prevention post uh, orthopedic surgery. Okay, so I'm just going to go through a, at least the ones that are most common, talk a little bit about half-life, and then we'll turn it over to our ER physician. Actually, we'll turn it right back up to Dr. Jang, I believe, correct? Okay. So dabigatran is Pradaxa. So this, again, is a direct thrombin inhibitor, blocks thrombin, the lowest on that co coagulation cascade. Half-life is somewhat longer than others in this class, 12 to 17 hours. And the most important thing about Pradax, it's 80% renally excreted, so not the drug that people should potentially use in patients who have renal insufficiency of any type because the majority of it is renally excreted. Um, like all these drugs, it's unaffected by food. No monitoring is necessary. It's indicated mostly on every indication other than prosthetic heart valves, and it's fixed dosing. And the reversible agent is Praxabind, or 
idarucizumab, which um, Dr. Tu, I believe, will discuss in greater detail. Rivaroxaban is Xarelto. So Rivaroxaban or Xarelto or Eliquis, Apaxaban are probably the most common ones that are utilized now um, by market share. So this is a factor 10A inhibitor. It inactivates circulating and clot-bound factor 10A. Its half-life is on Xarelto 12 hours. And what's different about a pack, uh, I'm sorry, did I go too far? Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, I must have hit it twice, I'm sorry. So Xarelto is actually lower half-life, five to nine hours, and it must be taken with food. So this is the big difference on the factor 10A inhibitors. This drug must be taken with a high caloric meal. If patients aren't taking it with a high caloric meal, the bioavailability of this drug is significantly reduced. So it's important to note. No monitoring is necessary. It's also indicated with everything with, except for prosthetic heart valves. The dosing is different with Xarelto. It's twice daily for 21 days, followed by daily dosing. So that's somewhat different than Apaxaban. Um, and it's dose dependent on renal function only in the AF indication. And the reversal agent is Indexanet which also Dr. Tu is going to discuss in great detail. So the difference here with Eliquis, or Apaxaban, is the half-life's a little bit longer. It's 12 hours. It's a twice-daily drug. Um, and it has everything pretty much the same as Xarelto, except it isn't affected by food. So it doesn't have that food uh, requirement that's necessary. And again, twice-daily dosing, same reversal agent as, in, um, as Xarelto. The other two, which I'm just going to spend a second about, um, is Edoxaban and bentrixaban. So endoxaban is actually only useful and not really used in the United States because it requires parenteral anticoagulation first. And for the most part, and I believe it will be confirmed by Dr. Tu, the ER physician, is that we rarely send patients with VTEs into the hospital anymore on parenteral therapy. We typically send them home almost same day, either on Xarelto or Eliquis and they never get that kind of preload with parenteral therapy. And because this drug was only approved after parenteral starting of therapy and loading, it's not really used that well or, or in this country at all. And then bentrixaban is actually only used for VTE prevention in hospitalized patients. Again, to have a drug on a hospital formulary that's just for this indication is extremely rare, and I would be very surprised to hear that any of you have heard of this drug or have used this drug in the past. So I just wanted to follow up and, on two particular items that I think will be helpful to going forward for this discussion. Number one is how we hold DOAX for procedures. And second is the definition of bleeding. And what is major bleeding, what is minor bleeding, what is other bleeding? Because it's incredibly important to understand the definition because of the trials that are out there and because of what we can do to reverse them if necessary. So no bridge is necessary for treatment of patients with NOACs. Okay, a NOAC, a DOAC, whatever way you call it, these patients do not need bridging with Lovenox, unfractionated heparin of any type. They never do. You should also never, ever listen to a pharmacist who says, these need to be stopped seven days prior to procedure because it's just like Coumadin. That's also not true. If you knew how many patients I saw with recurrent VTEs and recurrent PEs because they stopped their drug for seven days, it would be somewhat amazing to hear because it happens all the time. But the general guidelines, if you're using Pradaxa, two to three days or two to four days, depending on renal impairment, you stop the drug prior to a procedure and then you restart once homeostasis has been achieved. And I know we can probably go into a discussion as we get to the panel discussion as to what that means to you guys in terms of restarting. Um, on the factor 10A uh, drugs inhibitors, whether it's uh, Rivox, uh, Rivaroxaban or, Apex, or Pixaban, it's two days prior to a low-risk procedure, three days prior to a high-risk procedure. That's it. It should never be held longer than three days for anything. And when we talk about low-risk procedure, we're talking about upper endoscopy, colonoscopy, even with biopsies, that's the low-risk procedure. High-risk procedure would be any type of invasive surgery of any type. And then again, restarting once homeostasis has been achieved. And then my last slide is defining bleeding definitions. So there's three bleeding definitions in the literature when it comes to oral anticoagulants. Number one, major bleeding. Clinically overt bleeding, a decrease in the hemoglobin of greater or equal to two grams, or 
the transfusion of at least two units of blood in that patient, life-threatening bleeding sites, and bleeding that contributed to someone's death. So that obviously would be major bleeding. If it is, the next step is CRNM, clinically relevant non-major bleeding. So it's bleeding, but it isn't any of the above. It is associated with intervention. So someone, a patient needs to call you or call their doc. They need to show up in emergency room, so you have to have face-to-face -face contact with that patient to satisfy this definition, CRNM. Um, you have to, it has to lead to the discontinuation of the drug for one reason or another, or discomfort or some effect on their ADLs. And examples include GI bleeds, epistaxis, hematuria, that kind of level of bleeding. And if you don't satisfy major, and you don't satisfy CRNM, it falls into minor. And that's heavy menstrual bleeding, um, a cut, minor injuries like that. And this is a helpful to know prior to having that discussion that we're going to have regarding reversal. Um, whether we discontinue the drug, whether we hold the drug, whether we give a reversal agent that we talked about before. And I believe that was my last slide. And looking forward to the, to the panel discussion later. Thank you so much.